is basically the same. In 1868, the, the Illinois Natural History Society was formed in Bloomington. And here's our exhibit at the Columbian Exposition. It was a bunch of uh, natural history guys who got together with their collections and they made a museum. And you know, we still have some of these same specimens from here. In, 18, uh, six, in the 1890s, we became the State Laboratory of Natural History. In 1917, we became the Natural History Center. So we, our origins are exactly the same as this, through this cabinet of curiosity. So, the name of this activity is called Creating a Physical Journal. Okay, a physical journal. That's all a cabinet of curiosity is. It's, that's all a museum is. It's a physical journal of some story. Okay, so each of you will be given your own curiosity cabinet, and Sue will, I don't have one, do I have, I don't have one up here. It's a little plastic box, and it's divided into sections, and on the, on the lid is a, I just need one. Here's the cabinet of curiosity, on the, on the lid, we open it up, here's the, Provenance that goes in, so you can leave you can leave the lights on. All right. What what we'd like you to do is is collect natural history related objects that appeal to you, that mean something, that evoke your curiosity, and you create an object, a, 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 an observation, and the provenance that goes with each one of them. Okay. We all know that the, the, the museum is simply for the awakening of an intelligent interest in the mind of the general visitor. That's what these things are for. Here's a couple that, believe it or not, Sue and I do this on vacation. Oh, God, I know. <laughs> Here's a couple if you want to get lights again. I'm sorry. So you can combine all the things that we're teaching you. Here's the cover. Here's one from Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And there's all the things. You put the date and everything on the Date, time, time, yeah, location, all that, all that is provenance. And then here's one from Southern Utah. Heavy on rocks, you've been to Southern Utah. <laughs> There's also like 17 different kinds of sand in Southern Utah, so each one of those is, is represented in there. And, and as Stephen Gould said, of all of nature's glories, none surpasses the stunning variety of the myriad objects produced along the countless tweaks of several billion years of life's evolutionary tree. So there's a lot of stuff out there. And it doesn't have to be sophisticated or you know, a one-of-a-kind thing. It's just things that, that evoke your interest and that... Century. This is an 18th century England. No collecting in designated nature preserves. Okay. Collect only items that are already loose. Don't go ripping off or you know picking them off, flowers, those sorts of things. Collect only things that are not currently alive. You, know, you don't want slugs and insects crawling around your box. And do not collect nine game bird feathers or nests because they don't want you to go to jail. Okay. Everything else is, you know, you use your own, you can look at the, our examples and so forth and what we've found and, and, and this is a, your activity to go through as the, as the course progresses. The thrush, the thrush feather would not work. Right. And, and it, it, it'll get, yeah, dry, you know, go out, if you go out today and collect stuff and it's wet and put it in there, not such a good idea, you know, dry, all right. The initial Emmaquan Corps of Discovery, when they had your exhibit, they made one. Here it is in the corner. One of the gentlemen was a dulcimer maker. He made the, the, the 
case for it, and here all the, here's the provenance inside, you know, and that, that was part of the exhibit. Here are some of the cabinets of curiosity from the Madison Corps of Discovery. There's a lady that did mushroom prints, you know. And this was week two. We did this first week, you know, a bunch of overachievers. This lady made a little nest with yarn, you know, just a, a innumerable ways to make this charismatic, and when someone looks at it, it gives you a little story about the place that that was concerned with. Okay. Everybody got that? Mm -hmm. All right. One lady from one of the other core discoveries took it, and she went to one of the spice stores, and she liked color. And so each one is filled with different spices and all the different colors, and then she wrote about it. It was, it was quite interesting and unique. And what, somebody else did uh, tree seeds or something like that, wasn't it? That? Yeah. That are, the one in Ellington? Mm -hmm. I have one that's beaver chips from different <laughs> trees that they you're getting turned on. Lights on again here. Here's a couple of, when Sue and I went to, to, the, to see the sequoias, uh, we went to 17 different sequoia groves, and in every grove, we collected a sequoia cone, and then we took a photo of that grove, and then we wrote oh something from that sequoia grove. So it, it can be very specific. It can be very general. You can look at these later. Here's one where we just did a couple of things on Saturday night models. They don't have to be very fancy. Here's Sue actually took it another step, and here's a here's a Curiosity Cabinet journal. She'll explain it to you later, but it has pockets and it has the, the pieces of, of things in it. So and there's like a little card. It's like a library card pocket. So then there's a card, a three by five card in there where I wrote. And then I like stickers and stamps, so I decorated it. But it, it, it's just a way of focusing your mind, and, and, and I, I've, I've not seen a really good one yet from Emmaquan, although I, I... The big most, one that they made, the, the big one was good. One was cool. It had corn in it, and you know, corn cobs. And, and a piece of a pump house. I actually have the, uh, the last corn cob hop. I still know I have a little bag in my office, so if anybody, the last corn shuck that came from... <coughs> It has provenance now, so it's valuable. <laughs> okay. All right. This morning, you notice everybody has a little, little uh, cup of water on your table. And everybody, and there are brushes, okay. And there are these things. So these are your, these are yours. These are your watercolor sets. We're gonna, do, we're gonna do watercolor this morning. You can go ahead and open them up. Okay. Everybody gets one brush. Okay, and everybody, every table has a different assortment. You can only afford to give each one one brush. If you want more than one brush, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the little things accumulate. Okay. Well, oh, here it is. 
You don't have water color paper. Everybody gets one of these and one of these. And one of them is, is punched for your notebook and one of them isn't. So the one that's not punched for your notebook is the one we're going to be working on. Okay. Just for the record, when you go to the art store and, and you buy watercolor paper, which is maybe something you've never done before, it's going to be a bewildering array of, of different kind of papers. You know, first of all, you, you need watercolor paper because it has to stand up to water. water. If you do it on regular paper, it'll go curl up and it won't won't be very satisfying. So. There's three kinds of watercolor paper. There's a really rough texture that we use. To, I use a pencil here to illustrate how so when you put the paint on it, it, it has a texture to it. Then there's cold pressed, which is a little smoother. It still has a lot of texture. And then there's hot pressed, where it's very smooth. And these aren't wildly expensive, but they're, you know, they're not cheap either. So if, if you're uh, if, if you depend on a different style of what you do, this is a medium. What you have is a medium kind of in the middle here between hot press and cold press. Yeah. All right, brushes. Uh, you need brushes to do this, and you need brushes that that are soft and pliable yet firm. You, you want to be able to use those. They want to put blotches much as the paper, and there's something you need to do with these things. The first thing you do when, when, you, when you have a watercolor brush, you notice they all have these little cases on them. That's to protect them from, but once you take the case off and you use it, you can't put the case back on, right, without squishing the water brush. So when you store a watercolor brush, which way do you store it? Point down or point up? Point up. Point up. Otherwise, you're going to have a. You ever stored a broom too long without using it? Yeah. What does it do? All right. So these these aren't wildly expensive. They're not cheap either. So you always store it so that the point is pretty much sacred. Okay. If you're a, if you're a watercolor snob, you can buy sable brushes. You can spend twenty, twenty-five dollars, fifty dollars a brush. Okay, these are these are, uh, and then these are acrylic, uh, not uh, man-made fiber, human-made fibers. These like these were just as fine, you know. You don't have to be a synthetic. Is the kind of thing thinking about, and they can be round, which is what we we've given you. They can be flat. They can be angled. They can be big if you want to do big areas. Okay. If you're doing it in your journal, probably don't need this, probably don't need that. A, a flat-sided brush and a, and a pointed one. And you can do it, if, as long as your brush is in good shape and has a point on it, you can do everything with that same single brush. Okay? So you don't need to come out with your big pouch and have 37 brushes in it. A couple will do. Cost? Yeah. Go to Michael's and you can get a, a pack of, you know, and everything is always half price at Michael's. If you ever pay full price for art supplies, you know, because everything is always, you can get a, get a nice selection of nice water, nice synthetic watercolor brushes, four or five dollars, because usually ten to twelve dollars for a set, and you can usually get them half price. So you can have your own, and when they wear out, you simply take a scissors and trim them or get another one. If you're wearing out your watercolor brushes, I'll be very proud of you. Okay? Doesn't happen often. And you use all of them with watercolor. You don't use them to do your eyebrows or your lipstick. <laughs> you're not painting them, you know, the molding on the house with them. They're, they're just, you know, written, they're dedicated for watercolor. I know this makes it look really nice. That'd be really good for the woodwork, you know. I have watercolor paper. I'll start getting at least two pieces for everybody in for their notebooks. Okay. So you've got a practice piece. You've got a practice there. piece and then your, your notebook pieces. All right. So there are some techniques. Okay, here you have 
And there are lots of different colors. I could have given you the three primary colors and said, learn to blend. You know? <laughs> but we were nice, and we gave you lots of different colors. And the, the top of this is the mixing container, the mixing reservoir, you know, to mix the colors. Two things to note, when you, when you use these and you wet them, and you screw them back together, when you get home, you need to open them up and let them dry, because they are organic, and they, you will have scraped the fungus off otherwise. These are not the world's best watercolor, but they, they will, for what we're doing, they are, they are fine. And these are transparent watercolors, which means they're made, meant to be put on in layers. Okay. The other kind of watercolor that is, that is not transparent is called gouache, G-O-U-C-H-E. And it's a different kind of material, and, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about gouache later, but those are much more expensive. If you want to do gouache, fine, but this, this, this will work just fine. And this can go in your pocket, you know, like you said, it can go anywhere with you. Okay. So, some of the techniques. The most commonly used technique, and the easiest to control,